Let us pray. O Holy Spirit, by whose breath life rises out of death, come to create, renew, inspire. Come and kindle in our hearts your fire. Amen. Exactly one year ago today, I woke up early in the morning genuinely excited. I knew that what was to take place that day would change my life forever. From that day onwards, nothing was to be the same again. This new reality dawned on me when I put on my clerical collar for the first time in my life. Suddenly, some of the people I knew for long would start calling me Reverend or Father Matthew, and it all felt utterly bizarre. I remember weeping th in joy through most of my ordination ceremony, and I will probably never be able to explain the feeling I had when the bishop laid her ha hands on my head as a sign of consecration and ordination. But little did I know that uh, our lives were suddenly to change for another reason too. We had absolutely no idea that this massive event with over 700 people present in the church would be the last sign of normalcy and the last time we were about to hug one another, hold each other's hands, sing together, come to the Eucharistic table together, or be in church together. Only a day later, we received the news that Christ Church Georgetown became a COVID infection site and some of the people associated with the parish were actually at the ceremony. A few of my friends uh, got ill that week. Schools went online over a day. Virginia Theological Seminary that I attended was under total quarantine and I never went back to the campus again. Our lives were turned upside down by the lockdown, COVID safety rules, masks, canceled events, strained Zoom etiquette, and months of isolation. One year ago, we entered the strange wilderness of the COVID pandemic. Each one of us has experienced a degree of anxiety, depression, consternation, disorientation, or even the pain of losing friends and family. This COVID tide has driven us out of church and office buildings and reduced our lives to countless hours of Zoom meetings, cost some of us jobs and incomes, and separated us from our families. This COVID wilderness has brought to a tragic end over 520,000 lives in the U.S. alone. To make things worse still, the news of George Floyd's death at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer shook the nation to its core. In the midst of that wilderness, millions of Americans and people worldwide realized the devastating effects of racial hate, white supremacy, and the decay of truth in our everyday life. This Lenten wilderness that we entered into one year ago today has been so hard on all of us. Yet God has been with us all throughout this time, just like with the Moses and the Israelites wandering through the desert for 40 long years, or with Jesus when tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days. God has always been present at the side of those dying alone, alone in hospitals. God's love has beamed through masked faces of nurses and doctors. God's hands have been at work, at work packing food for the homeless or delivering our packages day by day. God's zeal for justice has, been, has turned our cities into Black Lives Matter plazas where thousands like prophets of old would stand no longer for the status quo. God's hope now shines through the lines of people waiting for their COVID vaccinations. 
And finally, God is with our parish family and us here today, worshiping online, and later on today, worshiping together outdoors for the first time since November. God has been with us through all this wilderness. God's covenant of love towards us has never wavered. One of our Eucharistic prayers reads that again and again, God called us into covenant with him, and through the prophets, he taught us to hope for salvation. Today, we started our liturgy remembering that eternal covenant that God invited Moses and the Israelites into on Mount Sinai. We did so following the church's ancient, ancient tradition that calls us into self-examination and repentance during the season of Lent. The Ten Commandments have played a massive role in shaping our Jewish and Christian ethics. I can still vividly remember when as a teenager I would lie down in bed at night, uh, recite the Decalogue, and think back on all my actions that day. But if we honest with ourselves, repeating those commandments can be quite a frightening reminder of our sinfulness. They are the ten best ways to live, but following these commandments is often insanely hard. Just try to remember the last time you genuinely observed the Holy Sabbath rest and didn't answer a single work email or did no random chores, but instead focused on God and rest alone. There is, however, another way of looking at the Decalogue. I offer you today that all too often these Ten Commandments have been reduced to moral principles only. When looking at them, we mustn't forget the context in which they were given to Moses. As you know, the Decalogue begins with a divine identification of God with the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Israel would have heard these rules not as burden, but as a gift, as an opportunity to grow into a deeper relationship with the liberating God. Each of these Ten Commandments contrasts with the ways of pharaohs, and they should not be read as divine finger-wagging or moral slapping, but instead as rules for freedom and justice. Instead of being enslaved by Pharaoh, Israel is now free to worship no other than God's self. Instead of being forced into constant labor, they are now invited into the Holy Sabbath and a recognition of the giftedness of all life and all creation. Instead of the overseers' ongoing hostility, they are now free to model their everyday life on loving their neighbor. Instead of mentality of greed-driven mentality of fearful notions of scarcity, they are now given that life that recognizes God's abundance. Having come out of the Egyptian slavery and journeying towards the promised land, the Israelites received a true mission action plan that will shape their life together as they form their new community. Because to be bound in covenant with God is to be set free to live as God's people. The Israelites must now structure their life in God on this epic internal logic of the commandments inscribed on the two tablets with statements on God and Sabbath on one tablet and the commandments towards their neighbor on, neighbors on the other. This logic teaches us that the way we attend to God must shape our attitude towards our neighbors. And all these actions must recognize the innate giftedness of all creation. Our sound theology gives rise to ethical behavior, which in turn 
con confirms the authenticity of our faith. At that moment on Mount Sinai, the Israelites knew that they were about to enter a new reality of the promised land with God on their side. By accepting God's commandments, they were remaking themselves into a new community, a community centered on liberating God, who called them into righteous and charitable living. Each Lent, but perhaps even more so at this time, this Lent, as we slowly move towards this new reality of post-COVID life, we too are called into becoming a new community. Recognizing the failure of our previous ways, we seek a better, more Christ-like future in which we aim to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. But the way of Christ, the way that should instruct our mission action plan today, is the way of foolishness and weakness, as Paul tells us in the epistle to Corinthians. God's foolishness is nevertheless still wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Christ tells us to be foolish enough to welcome a wayward son home, foolish to forgive 77 times, foolish to feed a crowd with only two fish, Foolish to stop for an uninsured stranger and pay for his health care. Foolish to defy the rulers of the world. Foolish to vaccinate the inmate and the homeless before the lawyer and the banker. Foolish to stand up to institutional structures of oppression and racism. Foolish to welcome the undocumented migrant with an open heart. And foolish to see God's face in the face of a prisoner. The world around us seeks strength, stability, prosperity, and shrewdness. But we proclaim Christ crucified. Finally, as we create our new mission action plan and grow into a deeper relationship with the liberating God this Lent, I'd like to ask you to close your eyes for a second. Allow yourself to bring to mind all these things for which you know you need to say sorry. Bring back, think back on those Ten Commandments that we've recited. And hear God's words speaking to you today. I know you better than you will ever know yourself. I know your pain. But this is the commitment I am making with you. This is the covenant I made with you even before you were born. And I will be with you always. Nothing that you will ever do will tear you apart from my love for you. You are a gift, a blessing. Now go out into the world and be my hands, my love, and my blessing.